All right. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for coming. Let's uh, try to see whether there are uh, additional seats. And uh, in the interest of time, let's uh, let's uh, get started. And uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, to introduce uh, Jan Stoika. Jan is a professor at UC Berkeley. And really, for for many of us, uh, Yang doesn't need any introduction. But as the host, I'm obligated to say some things uh, anyway. Uh, Yang is currently the director of the Sky Computing Lab at UC Berkeley, where his work focuses on cloud computing and AI systems. And Yang has done a lot of uh, influential work. Uh, for instance, uh, many of us have probably used his systems like Ray or Apache Spark. Uh, and many others. So Yang, um, in addition to uh, having done a lot of great research, Yang's work has um, significant real-world impact as well. Uh, Yang is a very successful entrepreneur, having co-founded uh, three companies, uh, the most recent being AnyScale uh, with Ray, and earlier with Apache Spark, which is behind Data Databricks, and even earlier um, from his uh, work in peer-to-peer -peer networks, um, Conviva on video streaming. And Yang has met, won many awards. Uh, he's an ACM fellow and a National Academy of Engineering member and an honorable member of, uh, uh, of the Romanian Academy. So thank you, Yang, for coming uh, to Michigan. And let's give uh, Yang a warm welcome. Thank you, Ang, and uh, great to be here. And uh, Hopefully, for the people who stand out there, I can make you this worthwhile. So the title of the talk is an AI stack, but another way to frame it is like an AI system journey. Um, and actually, during this talk, I am going to do something which I advise my students not to do. That is, I'm going to talk about a few systems, what I tell them you have really to talk about one thing, the best work you have done, and go you know, deeper. And, but anyway, so with that being said, let me start. So this is Prelude, right? It's like Apache Spark. This is uh, the first time we done, um, at least at Berkeley, um, work on the system at the intersection of system and AI. And this work happened in uh, AMLAB. And AMLAB, it's, you know, uh, Moshe Raf and Barzan, uh, some of your faculties, you know, they know about the lab. They are, uh, you know, spending time and being part of the lab. And that was about big data, AMP was standing for algorithm, machine, and people. And it was about making sense of the big data, which at that time, it was a pretty hot area. It has around eight faculties, around 50 graduate students and, uh, and uh, postdocs. And the one thing was very cool, it as we are all sitting in the same open area, uh, including the faculty. This is, you know, the faculty, some of the faculty gave away their offices and started these cubicles, right, in the middle of the lab. And also the lab included people from different areas. It was uh, systems, machine learning, in particular Michael Jordan, databases, Mike, Mike Franklin, and so forth. Um, so, so that's, and it was a very collaborative environment. That was the idea, okay? Um, so, and now, the story about, you know, AI in there, it was Lester McKee, which was the, uh, you know, one of the graduate PhD students of Michael Jordan um, and some of his fellows, uh, wanted to compete at this Netflix. Netflix, it was a Netflix competition, and it was prized, it was $1 million for whoever can uh, uh, de develop an algorithm, a recommendation algorithms based on the anonymized data provided by Netflix, which proves that in time it wasn't as anonymous as they thought, um, the best algorithm. So these people, it was a lot of you know, data for that, that stage, came to us, and basically ask what we should do, we should use. And well, you know, you should use Hadoop, right? This is what we told them. Now, the problem was after a few days, they came back and say, well, Hadoop is extremely slow. And why was that? Is because 
these algorithms, basically there is or not deep learning algorithms, okay? It's like collaborative filtering, this kind of algorithms you have there, classic machine learning. But still, and almost all machine learning algorithms are iterative, right? You are going to have a loss and you are going to iterate until, you know, the loss decreases and so forth. And each iteration was a map reduced job. Okay, so therefore, and the, with, with Hadoop, you have to read and write, actually not uh, at the beginning and the end of the job, but even between maps and reducer to, to read and uh, to, to write and read the data from, this, from the disk. And this makes it extremely slow. So each iteration, write the entire data on the disk, read the entire data from the disk. So Matei, you know, here comes Matei, and basically he put together some kind of, you know, a small, a system in Scala, and that was kind of early Spark. And the main idea of Spark is that why, you know, for these data sets, actually, they are not as large, you could actually store them in memory. So now, if you store this data in memory, it's going to be much faster. And Spark also has a more powerful API, in addition to MapReduce, is providing other operators. And of course, there are things about ensuring resilience and things like that. So what was the outcome? So this is a final leaderboard. The Berkeley team was the ensemble, and as you can look at the score, it's identical to the first team for the first, uh, which eventual winner, so it didn't win. The reason it didn't win, it was submitted 20 minutes later. <laughs> so you see the speed, it's extremely important. They should, have, they should have gone directly to Spark, right? No Hadoop there. Um, so, so that's kind of the story. So now, for, fast forward today, and I'm going, you know, uh, I've been involved in many of the systems, in many systems, and at different layers. I will put here infra and orchestration layer, like Mesos, SkyPilot, SkyPlane, Spark, and Ray, like distributed frameworks, some optimized engines like Alpa, Alpa Servant, DLLM, and application level chatbot Arena, Vicuna, and a few others. Uh, from this again, what happened with Spark, you know, it becomes, it, it was de facto standard for big data analytics. Uh, the Databricks was a company be behind it, or the other way around. The Spark is behind Databricks. Um, and the one who I want also to mention is Ray. This is for heterog heterogeneous building, uh, building applications on heterogeneous distributed clusters. And it's quite popular. It was used by OpenAI to train uh, GPT models, and many companies are currently building the AI infra and platforms on top of it. And it's, be, it's uh, raised behind this other company, Aniscale. During this talk, I am going to, to um, present these three projects, SkyPilot, VLLM, and Chatbot Arena, at different levels of the stack. And actually, they build, the, only, the connection here is they build on each other. But otherwise, it's very different. So now, let me start with SkyPilot. SkyPilot, um, and, and, and it's within this uh, lab, which is called Sky Computing, is the same place, the same more or less configuration, roughly the same kind of number of people. Uh, we call it AI now, not machine learning. That's kind of one difference. Um, and um, this actually is a lab between them was the RISE lab one we developed, Ray. So at Berkeley, there are these five years labs, each of them with its own mission and so forth. And if you want to say what is a mission of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, sky computing, it's basically to provide like the internet for the clouds. So let me tell you a little bit about sky, and then I'm going to talk about sky pilot. So obviously, the cloud has been a revolution. Is that the compute infrastructure of choice today, right? No question about that. Um, and however, despite all of this um, huge value it provides, today the clouds are quite fragmented, right? For instance, AWS has this kind of 300 services, right? Many of them are proprietary services, and more and more they also have proprietary infrastructures, right? Think about right now every cloud, major cloud, they develop their own accelerators. Right? Inferentia and Trainium AWS, Maya 100 is from uh, uh, Azure, and obviously GCP is TensorFlow processor units. Right? So what are the, what are the um, 
impact of this is because these are silos, right? If you are a customer, you are going to go to a cloud and pretty typically stick to that cloud, right? So this means you have limited choices and will only with respect to that cloud. And the clouds kind of lock you in, so it's also they can raise, raise the prices. Um, and so therefore, a user cannot use the best of breed hardware and software, right? Uh, um, they cannot satisfy, actually, another thing is data and operational sovereignty. So more and more um, regulations are around data sovereignty, which means that the data should be uh, stored within the boundaries of the country where it's, where, it's, where it's created. And operational sovereignty is even more stringent because it says that the data has to be processed by a data center which is managed by the nationals of that country. Okay? Um, you, and also you can uh, maybe not achieve resilience against cloud-wide failure. So now, this was a kind of all problem is we are not the first to think about wouldn't be nice to have to abstract away the clouds and build application and then run on any cloud, right? And there are, it's a lot of work for the past decade and so forth. And typically the, war, the, the kind of pattern is that you are going to have a portability layer which abstracts away the infrastructure and on that you are going to build the services, right? And then on top of that applications. And the example here is actually also a Sky Computing project 10 years ago with the same name. And then you have uh, uh, Azure Arc and, uh, and, and things like that even from cloud providers. Okay? And this is very natural design because this is how we are thinking you know, in 101 networking. That's IP, right? The abstractor is a hardware. The same is that in the operating system, like Cisco, like interface, right? So, so it's very natural. However, and unfortunately, these efforts have failed so far. And there are several reasons, maybe too complex, right? The amount of functionality you need to abstract away is huge, right? Um, and then you need to re-implement all of these cloud services on top of the portability layer, very hard. And then clouds have no incentive to support it because it will commoditize them. So our approach is different in the following thing. What we say, forget about what we are going to try to do, it's use the services which are existing in the clouds today. And see what we can do starting from there. So we don't ask anything from the clouds, right? And we try to figure out whether there are some applications for which we can make a difference, make it much easier to use services from different clouds. And fortunately, it's actually there are also quite a few services which are running on multiple clouds. They are pretty much the same, almost the same. And they are, a lot of them are powered by the open source projects. Like, for instance, Spark, Kafka, Kubernetes. Every cloud has a Kubernetes offering hosted cloud offering, Kafka offering, anything like that. Uh, there are third-party services, Snowflakes on multiple clouds, anything like that. So, so basically here there is no need to, for cloud to participate. We just use our services we are providing today, and we can build it today. Right? So the main uh, component of this guy is this intercloud broker. And the intercloud broker basically collects uh, information and uh, from users like jobs, uh, the, job, the code, and the specification uh, in terms of what services they want to use, right? Like hosted Spark or Kubernetes or whatever. And also some desired op criteria, optimization criteria, like I want this, this job to be optimized for minimize the cost or for performance or things like that, right? So you get all these requirements from the users. And then also collect information about what services different clouds provide, their availability, their cost, and things like that. Okay? And then if the broker places the jobs on appropriate clouds based on requirements, and then oversees the execution. If the job fails, it's restarting. If resources are preempted, restarts is maybe in different region, different cloud. That's basically what it is. Okay? So this is the cloud broker, it's kind of, you know, it's like on the control plane, it's not data plane, right, for now. And there can be multiple intercloud brokers for different applications and so forth. So now, once you get the high level picture of what Sky is, Sky Pilot, one way to can think about is intercloud broker for AI workloads. Okay, so what problems we try to solve here? One is GPU scarcity, right? You heard that for the entire year, 
you know, it seems that some people believe it's going to continue, like this AWS exec. So that's one, GPU scarcity. It's very hard to find GPU in the cloud. It's actually very hard even for people inside Google or people inside Azure, right? So it's real. The other one, if you get the GPU, they are very expensive, right, as you know, right? One of the reasons universities tries to get and, you, you know, <laughs> servers, GPU servers, is not only about scarcity, it's also because of cost. We are trying to do that at Berkeley before this scarcity, right, for the same reason, right? Uh, and, and then it's like these models, Training this model is very expensive. GPT-4 depend what number to use was between 60 and 100 million to train, right? So cost and scarcity. And then, okay, so now you have Sky, you know, you're talking about Sky, so you know, now you can use multiple clouds and you can use multiple instances and things like that, but it's expensive, right? It's expensive, you have a huge number of choices. You need to provision, then you need to do the data transfer if you compute in a region or in a cloud or the data or, or, <laughs> and your data is stored in another uh, to set up, to manage the job and so forth, right? And by the way, availability is a big problem, right? It's like many times you can go and you try to get, you know, how many of you want, uh, you know, to whatever the cloud and try to get some GPUs and you get something like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, it's this, this kind of is, is complex, right? Yeah, I, I, I can tell you all, use all these resources, you, you, you use all these credits for you, all these clouds from which, for which you have credits, it's not going to be easy, right? So this is what it is. The Sky Pilot is handles this, you know, uh, all this uh, cloud uh, infrastructure, make it easier, reduces friction, and at the same time, I aim to save the cost and uh, maximize availability, okay? Um, so, and initially we built SkyPilot, it's on AWS, Azure, and uh, GCP. So basically in this case, it's very simple. You know, the users basically submit the jobs, they say what kind of resources they need, like A100, and then SkyPilot picks the best location, provision, and runs the job, and then clean up the resources. So now, this is a typical, a very trivial uh, ML project. You know, you have a, um, you inst pip install the requirements, what kind of modules, uh, libraries to use, and then you, 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 you run, you use Python to do train Pi, okay? So how this looks in a Sky Pilot, you have a YAML file, you have, you put all this, you know, the pip install and running the Python, uh, running the train.py, but in addition, you also specify the accelerators and where the, or, 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 or where the data is, right? Things like that, okay? And you give this to SkyPilot, and the SkyPilot is going to do the rest. You do Sky Launch Task YAML, and SkyPilot, you know, is going to find some available instances in some regions and so forth. When doing that, SkyPilot, when to do that, SkyPilot keep a list, for instance, of for various instances and for their, you know, which, what are their prices in different regions. Even in, the sing, in a single cloud, as you probably know, there are the same instances, they are priced differently in different regions, right? And um, of course, that also happens across clouds, the difference in prices can be even larger and availability, okay? So under the hood, what happens when you submit a task, a job, you know, the SkyPilot on one hand has this component which is service catalog, and like I mentioned to you, which collects the information about services and the instances available in different clouds, and prices and availability. This is refreshed periodically, then, there is an optimizer, we take in the requirements from the users and based on the information in the catalog, is going to um, and come with some decision where to run the job given the information again in the catalog, the requirements from the users and considering data and compute location, data, data egress cost and things like that, right? Now when you decide, to say I want to run this in this region, it tries to allocate to provision in that region, 
Um, if he doesn't, if he cannot, he's going to try another region or another cloud. And once he's going to um, you know, resolve the instances and maybe start a cluster, a cluster or whatever, he's going to execute the job. Once the job is run, it's, it's, it's um, done, is the allocate the resources. At the same time, it's again, if you have failures, if you have preemptions, SkyPilot take care of that, right? So here is one example. So, so you know that in these clouds, you have this kind of two types of resources, on demand and spot instances. Spot instances are much cheaper, but you can get, they can get preempted, right? You have a two minutes warning, but whatever. But they get preempted, right? So you may lose them. But they can be three times cheaper. So ideally what you want, you want to have both, right? Um, and here, and SkyPilot gives you that. And this is what an illustration. This is about training a bird model for three days. This is a loss rate, so you want the loss rate to go down. And uh, this is a, around one day training. So you start to allocate, the, the SkyPilot allocates the resources on AWS US West 2A. But after a few hours, this spot, because our spot, spot instances are preempted. So SkyPilot then makes a the decision that and looks around and finds resources now in US West to see and basically restarts the job from the previous checkpoint. We assume here that the job is going to take these checkpoints. Uh, it runs for a while, it's again is preempted, then again it's going moving back in West 2A because now are available resources. And finally, after the last preemption, decides to go to Google, right? And it runs until the end, okay? So that's kind of what it is, all right? And you get 70% cost, cost saving versus on demand with really no loss in performance and in you know, the time it takes, right? Okay, so that's one, and again, yeah. Uh, the second example I want to, to give you is like SkyServe. So SkyPilot and SkyServe, it's part of SkyServe. The naming is not the most fortunate. Um, but this is about that uh, SkyPilot was mostly initially for job, for batch jobs, training or whatever. Uh, but what about serving, right? Especially if you are going to serve this large language model, you know it's like they are a big workload, bigger and bigger workload now. And it's the same thing you have here, right? You are going to try to serve, and you can use one of the serving systems like TGI, Triton, and things like that. But what happens if you want to scale up, right? And you don't have, you no longer have resources, right? What you can do, again, with SkyServe, right? You you know, it's like, because you no longer have uh, resources there, you can go to another region or to another cloud. Okay? That's what it allows you to do. By the way, it's pretty clean. It's doing DNS redirect for that. It's, it's, um, it's looking at the availability in real time of all of these uh, uh, regions in the same cloud or different clouds, right? Here, it's in this example, one a set of replicas are running on lambdas, and one other set is running on, are running on GCP, right? And now when things are coming together, actually we use SkyServe, and on top of that we use VLLM for model serving, and this is the infrastructure we used um, to serve this uh, chatbot arena I'm going to talk <laughs> in a little bit. So that was first. Um, actually, before ending, I want to say two other things about SkyPilot. When we started, remember, we have only these three clouds, right? The major ones, right? Since for the last year, actually, we got a lot of contribution, other clouds adding support to uh, SkyPilot, right? I think total is 12. And this is very nice, right? And, and some of them, they, they, uh, they, and actually quite a few of them, they add support because some of their users ask, say, well, we are using SkyPilot, you know, can you support it, right? Because people like SkyPilot if they use it, right? Because they are not no longer uh, linked to a particular cloud and they can, you know, easily move their workload from one cloud to another. And of course, you know, like, 
these guys, they have the entire incentive, which are not the major three clouds, although some of them are big, like Oracle and obviously IBM Cloud, um, uh, because they want to workload, right? That's why they are incentivized. This is a very, very nice thing to say. Uh, this we, are, we are thinking this will happen, but it's very nice to see always when it happens. Um, yeah, so you know it, it's 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 a healthy project. Uh, what can I say? You see the numbers. Uh, you know, Mistral has used it. Um, you know, Shopify is using it. Things like that. Now, under Sky, there are many many projects, right? It's like, and I'm just going to list here. It's cloudcast. This is to minimize the. Co you, you need to move the data. If you need to move the data, like for instance, you have a model and you are going to serve the model in different regions, in different clouds. You want to multicast, to broadcast that model to each of region. How you do it, do you do that um, efficiently, low cost and low latency? Uh, Sky Sport, Sport, you have a job and you may want to meet a deadline. How can you use a combination between spot instances and demand instances in order to meet the deadline and reduce the cost? Uh, Sky Hedge is a similar thing, but meeting SLOs for services. Uh, Starburst integrate on-prem clusters to Sky, and Sky Identity, obviously, it's adding a layer of security on top, okay? And Sky Storage, multi-cloud storage on top of the blob stores you have in every cloud, okay? So now I'm down with Sky. The second project I'm going to talk about is VLLM, right? So Sky is really orchestration, uh, resource orchestration. What is the story here? Everyone knows. LLMs are very popular since the uh, release of ChatGPT, and you have more and more applications using these large language models. And the problem is that serving LLMs is very expensive, right? And at least these are some data from, you know, since we, last year, right? It's, it's one year old project. Um, you know, LLMs run on higher end GPUs, as you know, and you know, for NVIDIA A100, even if you have a certain billion parameter model, which is not that very large, right? Um, you can get only up to a few requests per second. It's order of magnitude larger than what you get from a web server, right? It's like in terms of cost, right? So this is a problem, right? Now, why is this, why is this? And I know that almost everyone knows, but let me give you an 101 why this happens. You know what these LLMs are about, right? Autoregressive models. So basically you get, you know, you get a prompt, and these large language models statistically are going to decide what is the next word or token. Okay? Now, the key that when they do that, they use this attention mechanism, they, and this attention mechanism looks at all the, the tokens which are before the new token, right? So it looks at the entire prefix to decide the next token. That's what we need to remember, right? So for instance, for you know, deciding on the, they look at artificial intelligence is, and for deciding the next word, Future, they look at artificial intelligence if the future, right? And they go until they, the last token is like end of sentence, right? And that's the result, output, okay? So what is the problem here? Um, the problem here is that it's low throughput. That's why it is, right? It's not CPU bounded. And why? Because tokens are generated one at a time, right? Initially, when you have the prompt, the prompt is in parallel, right? For the first token, but after that, it's one at a time, right? So you have this kind of expensive GPU process, you know, generating one token at a time and not being very utilized, right? Because GPUs are about parallelism. You cannot take advantage of parallelism. So what is the idea? It's an obvious idea. Well. If you cannot have parallelism with Xeno and request, just serve more requests in parallel, a batch of requests. Right? That's what it is. The problem now, now you run out of memory. And I'll explain why. So that's the problem, right? So here is how the memory layout, um, or what, for A140 gigabytes of GPU RAM, 13 billion parameters. 
Parameters, these are the weights, 26 gigabytes. Why? It's 13 billion, each parameter is two bytes, 16, 16 bits. So 26 gigabytes. And now you have this thing which is called KV cache, key value cache. What is that? Again, I'm not going to go into details, but a basically it's a, you know, it stores the embeddings. These are representations of each token. Again, to get the next token, you need all the previous tokens. You need to store the embeddings for all the previous tokens to, to, to get the next token. And these embeddings are large, like think about one megabyte. So one request can take several gigabytes. Okay? That's a problem. Okay? Now, it's getting a little bit worse because the memory management for this kind of, uh, you know, at least at that time, it's very simplistic. It's basically what this, what, what the system at that time they were doing, um, they stored the se sequence in a contiguous memory, right? Contiguous memory allocation. And because it's contiguous, you need to pre-allocate, right? You need to kind of the maximum, you know, uh, output size, right? That's kind of what it is, right? So it's very inefficient. And everyone who took operating systems, they know this, and they know also the solution to this. Uh, but let me go in more details. So this is a request, right? This is a prompt, artificial intelligence is. And then you need to pre-allocate all these slots for the maximum length, because you need to be contiguous. There is another subtle thing here. Even if you know the length of the output, it's still not efficient. Why? Because, you see, you, you occupy this, you know, whatever, the, you, you reserve embedding the reservation one by one, right? So you have 1,000. First you occupy one, the second one, the third one. So the rest, you know, like, even though you are at the end, you are going to occupy all these 1,000, the one at the end, they are not going to be used for a long time. And that's an opportunity lost because other requests might could have used those right, before you need them, okay? So that's what we call the reservation. So first it's internal fragmentation, When the internal fragmentation is because you don't know the output, the reservation is that even if you know the output, you, because you are not using all the, all the memory you reserve right away, then it's a waste. And then it's external fragmentation because different requests are allocated different sizes, and you may end up that you're going to have gaps of various sizes, these are the gaps. So even on the aggregate, you have enough memory for a new request because it needs to be stored contiguous and you don't have a gap which is large enough, you may not be able to serve, to, to serve that request. That's what it is. And this is a serious problem. These are different solutions uh, before. This one is even assume Oracle, you know the future. And um, so this means that you know the output size. And you know, even if you know the output size, the important thing to look here is a green one, green block. You lose, use only 38% of the entire um, memory. Okay? So what do you do? It's very similar with operating system. Right? The operating system, from the process perspective, you have a contiguous address space. You cannot have that in the physical memory. What you do is paging, one level of indirection, right? The same you do here. You have blocks. This is a level, the granularity, at which you are going to allocate memory. Blocks contains multiple embeddings. And you have these block tables. You see, this is a logical view. So it's from application view, it's contiguous. Block 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. From physical layer, Physical, uh, physical view, different blocks are stored at different locations, right? So they are not contiguous. And then you have an indirection point, right? Saying block zero here, it's in uh, this kind of logical view, it's block seven in uh, physical memory. And then you have this kind of counter because now, you know, as, as you add, tokens and you are going to fill a block, you need to know when you fill the block and then you start allocating the next one, right? Okay, 
That's pretty much what it is. Okay? And by the way, um, because in many workloads, you know, for many techniques, you do parallel sampling. For the same prompt, you generate multiple outputs to get a better output and so forth. You can, again, like in operating systems, you can share the prompt, right? Not only that it's efficient, but, you know, the common part of different uh, queries, it can be shared. Um, so what is the end result? The end result is that you can actually get 96.3, you know, uh, or, or uh, efficiency allocation, right? Usage of the memory, which is, you know, almost three times more than the best, if, <laughs> even if you are, you are Oracle, but this is not realistic. This is more realistic, so it's more than three times more more than three times better utilization, okay? And that means, what does that mean? That you are going to, it's, you can process more requests in parallel. If you process more requests in parallel, you increase the throughput. If you increase the throughput, you reduce the cost, right? Because you do more unit of work on the same time, and you pay the same because you pay for the hardware, right? This is comparing, um, which, the solution back then, and this is about throughput, right? Um, and as you can see, the throughput is it's blue, right? Higher the better. Uh, this is for two models, Lama 7B and 13B, and you know you have up to 3.5 higher throughput, okay? Which means 3.5 higher lower cost. Now let me. Uh, also, I, I talk about this analogy, but you know, like everything, you know, like every problem at the first sight seems absolutely identical, but it's a little bit in a different domain. Then once you start working with it, on it, you see a, little, a few differences. So what is the same? What's well, very similar? Like OS pages, like KV blocks, right? And to reduce the memory fragmentation. You can share pages across processes, the same way you share KV blocks across samples, about multiple samples of the same query or multiple queries. What are the differences? Eviction, you see? The eviction in the operating system is page level. Now, the equivalent of paging in our case is block. But when we evict, it doesn't make sense to evict a block, only a block in the middle of the sequence, because the other blocks will not be enough to compute the next token. So when you evict, you evict the entire sequence. The other thing is that loading blocks pages back to memory. Here, when you do the paging, you store on the disk in the swap, right? And then when you need them back, you read them from the disk. You could do the same thing, for instance, moving the data from the GPU RAM to the CPU RAM, right? You can do that and get them back. However, it turns out that in this case, or in some cases, it's easier to forget. Don't store them, just throw them away. And when you need them, you recompute the entire sequence. And why is that? Because again, GPUs are highly parallel, right? So it just takes, in some cases, it's faster to recompute than go to the GPU and get um, these uh, blocks back. So VLA adoption, you know, it's fast growing fast. This is one year old project. Um, many projects using it, um, many companies, and the most, what I'm most happy about, it's actually we have right now more and more hardware uh, accelerator providers adding support for VLM to their chips, like AMD, Intel, AWS Inferentia, and soon Google, okay? And there are two things about VLM. VLM is the artifact, but the technique I mentioned to you, which I forgot to tell you, it was in the slide, it's called page attention. Now, page attention as a technique, it's also now used in all major other LLM engine, service engines, right? Not VLLM, right? Fireworks, Hugging Face, DJI, NVIDIA, TRT, LLM, these are competing. This is proprietary, this is semi-proprietary, semi-open, whatever you want to call it. You know, they are kind of competing, and, but they use page attention. 
No, like flash attention. You know, everyone is using it. Okay, so that's my second. Now the last chapter. Um, yes. Do you really need all the tokens? Like, if I had a long sentence. Yes. Would I really need at the you know when I'm or let's say a paragraph I'm generating? Yeah. Uh, would I need the very very beginning if I'm already have generated you know three paragraphs worth of a yeah. you know large prompt? Would they need all of it? Like yes, so most of the cases, yes. There are optimization and there are tricks, like you can have a window or things like that. Okay. But, but that's kind of uh, had an impact on the quality. Uh, but it would affect your paging mechanism in that case, right? Yeah. You might, your eviction policy might be dependent on whether such a window is appropriate or not. Yeah, yeah you can do that, but you'll need semantics from the algorithms and things like that. You can do it. You can do it. We, do, we don't do it because not, all, not a lot of models do that now, right? But you, you can do it, yeah. And by the way, the one thing, again, is one, one difference is that, you know, the, that's one av advantage. If, if you look about the one thing with probably which is very important, which I missed, all these differences, is this is because application level paging. So you see, we, do, we can do this. Request level versus page level eviction because you have semantics about the application, right? We know that a block in isolation is not very useful, right? Like if we, you know, without a block, the, sorry, without a block, the entire sequence is not very useful. And this is the same thing because we know how to recompute, right? So that's kind of a very important aspect. Okay, so let me go to the next one. Chatbot Arena. This is very different. LLM evaluation is running on top of what I discussed so far. <laughs> so what, yeah, this is, is benchmarks, right? And this is Dave Patterson, and he famously said, for better or worse, benchmarks shape a field. And this is true for AI, right? It's like image net and all of these tests before, for at least for image um, recognition and so forth. Okay, very important. The problem is that LLMs are extremely hard to evaluate. Why? Evaluation is expensive and it's unreliable. So let me give you, show you why they are expensive. This is a question. Develop a Python program that reads all the text files under a directory and returns top five words with the most number of occurrences. Okay? Okay. And you get this, two answers from A and B. Which one is better? Everyone knows, he knows Python. That's my point, it's hard, it takes time, right? <laughs> now, you may say, oh, this is program, it's hard to, you know, do it. Let me give you another one. Photosynthesis. It's a vital, vital process for life on Earth. Could you outline the two main stages of photosynthesis, including where they take the place and what are their inputs and outputs? And you get this. Which one is good? Is correct. <laughs> right. Why is that? <laughs> it's got fifty percent chance of. Of, uh, yeah. Okay. So that's why they are hard. They are also unreliable because data contamination. A lot of these benchmarks are static. And as you know, the LLMs are trained on every, all the data they can find. In fact, the data is now the bottleneck in the sense that they don't find enough data. They don't have enough data. So. This side is one some of examples, right? This was when GPT-4 was launched, and you have this kind of code force, problem from code force. And 2021 was, if you remember, the first chart GPT was trained on all the data before 2021. So the problems which are before then, solve them 10 out of 10, okay? After that, zero out of 10, okay? Here is another example. Um, is, is this paper basically claiming that um, 
GPT-4 can score 100% on MIT ECS curriculum with the right prompting. And here is a few days later. Well, it turns out that GPT was already trained on this. And actually, if you take that into account, it's actually only 58% is correct. OK? Still maybe impressive, but <laughs> OK? So that's what it is, OK? So now, our story and when we encounter ourselves this problem is that while we develop this kind of vicuna, after Facebook released this Rama in February 2023, we released this vicuna, which was um, fine-tuned on a shared GPT data, 70,000 uh, conversation, 70,000 yeah, conversation. And this shared GPT is pretty high-quality data, where pe people who are sharing their conversation with GPT uh, to this shared GPT uh, site. And this site was uh, providing the ability to download this conversation. For the community. Okay? So now we develop this. Now, how we figure out how good it is, right? That was a problem. And humans take a long time. And you know, you're asking your students, you know, you are it's hard, right? Who wants to go through, you know, to, to say which one is better. So there, what we had this idea then back then, and this is now pretty popular, is to use GPT-4, which was released just two weeks before to evaluate instead of humans, right? That's kind of what we tried, OK? And you know, we look at that. This is, you, know, you remember the first question, right? So actually, this was the answer from uh, GPT, GPT-4. Assistant A is similar, but that doesn't handle case sensitive or punctuations. So actually, assistant B gives a better answer. Between this one, you're right. Okay? <laughs> assistant A, they both say a lot of things, correct. But assistant A mixes the input and output between stages. That's what it is. Right? Although it's a more verbose answer. OK? So pretty happy. But of course, this is not satisfying, because what is the baseline? Is still, this is going to be uh, consumed by humans. So you need to figure out how you compare this, these results with what human results provide. So then we went to design a mechanism and a framework for getting the humans, basically input the humans, to evaluate these models. And this is Charbot Arena, what it's about. Now. So ideally, you have the question, you get an answer from each LLM, and you rank them. Right? Which one is better? That's one thing. There are a few issues with that. One of them, it turns out that ranking and choices is hard. Right? Um, it's actually easier to pick if I give you n choices to pick the best one. But even for that, it's not that easy. You know this book, The Paradox of Choice, basically saying the more choices you have, the harder it is to make the decision, which is better. The easiest one to do it, if I have you two choices, pick which one is the best. That's the easiest for humans. OK? So this is what we do. So now you have, you give two choices, pick the best. OK? But now there are many ways to do that as well. One way is to do kind of tournament. For the same question, you play every combination of LLMs. Right? Every two LMs. This is similar with um, tournament, right? It's like, like, like in soccer, you do it. But this is hard. And actually, there is another problem. The other problem is that this, is this, this, this assumes st static, right? You start with the same number of teams, and for the entire championship, you have the same number of teams. But this is not the case in our, you know, because um, um, in reality, you have these large language models popping up every week or every day. So it's dynamic. Now, fortunately, if you look again what humans do, because they have to deal, you know, they have to evaluate humans, right? Humans evaluate humans, right? How, how they do it. Another way is to compute kind of uh, rating. When you have rating in many things, you have tennis. And one, the one thing which is also 
popular, it's chess, right? Right? The rating. And chess, again, is like actually you have a rating which is meaningful. Even if two players, you can rank, rank two players even if they never played together, right? So this is what we use, the ELO rating. <laughs> and then we develop this kind of chatbot arena. So when you go to chatbot arena, um, you are presented with something like that. And um, you are going to get to ask a question, and you are going to be presented two replies from two randomized, anonymized LLMs. Right? And then you can pick A is better, B is better, tie, or both are better. And based on these answers, you compute the yellow rating. This is one of the latest, I think it's two days ago. So you can see GPT-4 up, Claude 3 opus, the largest. It's actually very close now. Right? Um, what you have here? Um, yeah, Cloud and this is our own. Right now it's the best open source model, Alibaba. Then the next one is Mixtro. Here. Again, it's a reason of, you know, reason of the close. Okay? But the, the interesting thing to, to look here is that this model, which are open source, are better than GPT 3.4, 3.5, right? And another thing to look here, which is interesting, and that why this is very useful, you see, you have two GPT 4s here. And these numbers represent when they were released. This is March, one year ago. Tomorrow is that one year, exactly. And this was in June. So you can see this March one performed better. Do you know why? Alignment, more alignment. And basically saying more times, I don't know the answer. Um, so uh, it's, you know, it's very popular right now. It's like some numbers. It's from April 23 until now, we have 10 million, over 10 million of user requests, over 400,000 votes, uh, over 70 models we tested, we evaluated. Uh, now we have 100,000 requests per day um, and 5 to 10,000 votes per day. Uh, 100 languages more, and this is the distribution, most English. Now, you imagine why this? Because we bribe people, because we basically also provide them some free access to the top models, right? But the point is, and this is the things, you know, but the votes, this is a, these are the votes. The votes also increase, right? Even with bribing, the votes almost increase proportionally, okay? Now, the question I told you, so what I told you is like, okay, we use, we, we use GPT-4 as a judge. Now we have this kind of chatbot arena, and basically we can scalably, you know, basically crowdsourcing the evaluation, right? And how, you know, we, we, we want to see how they compare. So can you really trust LLM as a judge? And we had this systematic study. And it's very interesting, because the limitations of using GPT-4 as a judge are not unlike humans. Here it is. They exhibit position bias. They prefer the first answer. Verbosity bias prefers the long answers. Self-enhancement bias prefer answers, you know, like <laughs> you'll, 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 you know, you'll, you'll do yourself, right? Uh, and limited reasoning. Not good at grading math questions, okay? It's very much like many of us. So, but the most important figure here, and again, there are different ways you are going to account on for these biases. I'm not going to go into details, but the most important is to look at the agreement. And if you look at the agreement between humans, excluding the ties, you know, sorry, if you look at humans and GPT-4, no, sorry, if you look at the agreement between, GPT, between humans, it's 81%, okay? So two humans only agree with themselves in 81% of the cases. If you look at the GPT, that's 85%. So okay, so it's in ballpark, right? So the kind of agreement you have between human to human and human to GPT-4 is pretty similar, 
Uh, when I started, I said about data contamination. What about data contamination? Uh, ChatGPT, um, it's at large extent alleviates the problem because a lot of users come with kind of new questions all the time. Questions they care about to get the answers to, especially since they get this answer from some of these top models, right, for free. Okay, so that's kind of one. But I think that going, um, you know, beyond that, we really need again to, to, to you know, like to get use more inspiration of how humans evaluate humans. And how, how do you evaluate humans? Through exams. And these exams are typically one time exams, right? It, it's like we don't give the same exam over and over again, right? Yes? Um, have you noticed more and more data? Sorry, can you speak louder? Have you noticed more and more data contamination as like people like are kind of like mess with their RGT? Yeah. Yeah, the question is whether we observe more and more data contamination as people ask questions. So maybe question. Um, we look and anecdotally we don't see it, but that's a, st a study which we are uh, trying to do, right? Be people asking the same question and so forth. By the way, there is another kind of contamination um, which is important right now because this uh, is pretty popular, this is leaderboard. We have model providers come and coming to us and saying, can you evaluate it before they announce it? And from some large companies. And uh, that's, you know, it's very interesting. Um, what I can tell you, and I, 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 you know, have some data, it's very varied. The time, the kind of topics is very varied. It's, 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 it's pretty broad. And not only that, but there are quite a few difficult questions. One of these top, one of the top three uh, model providers that you know, can, you know uh, who are the top three um, told us that actually these are harder questions than they see from their users. So they are also not trivial questions. Okay, anyway, so going back, I think that what we want to go further is to have these one-time exams. Maybe the experts can put together these exams and I don't know what. Okay. Um, and we are working with Kaggle to set up such exams. Okay. So I am done. So here is my last slide. I think that everything, what every st all the stack you've seen, it's open source, right? It's a debate between closed source, open source. I am obviously definitely in the camp of the open source, right? No surprise here. And we do believe that's the future. Uh, and I talk about three projects: SkyPilot which aims to improve the GPU availability, reduce the cost, and reduce the friction of users taking advantage of GPUs across multiple regions in the same cloud or across clouds. VLLM to reduce the cost by improving throughput of LLM serving. And Chatbot Arena is basically to evaluate to an evaluation platform for large language models that alleviates the contamination and again also reduces the cost. Um, again, we are just scratching the surface here. I think huge number of challenges between systems and AI. And, uh, you know, very much looking forward for many of you to contribute and solve some of these challenges. Thank you. <laughs>